So um, I want to begin, and I, want, I, I really felt led to begin, with an understanding of what our sacraments are. So there you see our baptismal font. By the way, that's a heavy sucker. Don't try to do it by yourself. I, I got it down by myself. I made it. Um, it cost me something, but I, I made it. Um, and thank you to the Altar Guild for preparing it for me. Um, and then also, um, the, you know, of course, all the elements for Holy Communion, and you'll partake of that today, as is our custom. So I want to begin um, in this way. So if you want to understand the nature of Methodism, the nature of Methodism is salvation. So I'm going to say that again. The nature of Methodism is salvation. Now, as the first service heard this, we throw the word salvation around like we understand its meaning. I mean saved, right? Saved from something. But frankly, I don't think we do. I don't think we really understand it because I think if we really understood it, we would hallow it in such a manner that we would not use it triflingly. You know, when you were growing up, you were told, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And that could mean a lot of things for a lot of families, right? Uh, same here. I think if we understood salvation, we would hold it in the same reverence. Now, I'm making a lot of drama of this point, but as I'm beginning a sermon series with you on what it means to be a Methodist, and this, a Methodist church, I wanted to be perfectly clear with you from the start. Um, in Judaism, there's a term, uh, and if you have heard this term, would you raise your hand? I just want to get a sense. A Baal Teshuvah? Anyone heard of a Baal Teshuvah? Just curious. A Baal Teshuvah is a Jew who assumes some kind of traditional religious observance after having lived a life of sin. Now the words literally mean, in Hebrew, owner of return to the way of God. A little cumbersome there, but I'm about to explain its meaning. It's a term that signifies the journey that one might take toward redemption, but it also captures the devotion necessary to maintain that journey, right? Owner of return, owner of return. I'm owning my return to the way of God. So when we've done a wrong so terrible that perhaps our very blood boils at the thought of not writing it, when our heart trembles at the thought of doing nothing about it, when our heart can't bear the thought of allowing that wrong to stand. We get a glimpse of what it means to turn. So the old hymn goes, when true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, no, we shan't be ashamed. And to turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Old Quaker hymn, you know. That's the stuff right there. Now, there's something in the heart of God that loves a penitent person. You'll recall the parable about the shepherd leaving the 99 to go after the one. And God isn't like that because of some, I don't know, seeking advantage or, or perhaps pettiness or fame. God knows what God has created. And the penitent person exemplifies a very rare strength that a person who perhaps has not sinned or tries to do right every day, or on the other side of that, cares nothing for redemption, simply does not know. There's a strength there that the penitent person shows. And turning, turning in the spiritual sense is not easy. I think it pulls at the world. I mean, a person might live one way their whole life, and they're reinforced by the people around them. And then something happens that gets them questioning whether or not they might have lost their way. 
And when that happens in a family dynamic, the people around them recoil, you know, because suddenly, hey, one of these things is not like the others. What's wrong with this person? Why are they acting that way? In group dynamics, we call it the identified patient. Often, that person sacrifices themselves and whatever it was that caused them to want to turn to just maintain the peace. You see this in families all the time. Carl Jung, the vaunted psychotherapist, said, I feel very strongly that I am under the influence of things or questions left incomplete and unanswered by my parents and grandparents and more distant ancestors. An impersonal karma within a family passed on from parents to children. And this karma can be damning. You know, some call it generational sin. Sin has a way of replicating itself. And it's not just in families, of course, even in greater society. It creates systems of reinforcement. And woe to the one who dares to question the status quo. You know, a, a person might experience a moment of innovation in the midst of that system of reinforcement. And that, that innovation might have merit. You know, people might say, hey, that's a pretty good idea. But if it goes against the grain of the system of reinforcement, it doesn't matter if it's a good idea or not. It's usually squashed for the sake of uniformity. The emotion in which it is squashed, because I think we can all remember a time in our life when something like that happened, and the one doing the squashing might be very emotional about it. That emotion tells the true tale. It reveals the doubts and insecurities of those who maintain the reinforcement. Now, on the cover of your bulletin is a picture. You can look at it. It's an illustration of how the founder of Methodism, uh, John Wesley, was saved from his home in Epworth, Lincolnshire, UK. And that picture bears more significance than you might know. So. You see a man pulling the then five-year-old John Wesley out of the window. And the fire, the event, took place on February 9th, 1709, sometime after 11 p.m. Now you can see the Wesleys there, the Wesley family sort of huddled there off to the right. They had successfully made it out of the rectory that John's father, Samuel Wesley, had been provided by his church, and that rectory still stands to this day. You can visit it. Well, John was stranded on the upper floor, but parishioners braved the flames to rescue him. And I believe the man on one knee there, facing the burning, uh, I think that's uh, meant to be Samuel, you know, father begging for his son's life. And Wesley later described this episode, because it left a mark on him, as if he had been a brand plucked out of the fire. Those words are from the prophet Zechariah. And there's a, a little story there. God is rebuking Satan for attempting to accuse the then high priest of Jerusalem, Joshua was his name, saying, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a brand plucked from the fire? And an angel speaks to Joshua and notices that he's in filthy clothes. So the angel tells the people nearby, hey, this guy needs some new clothes. Take these filthy rags off. And this is literally what the angel says. It says, see, I have taken your guilt away from you, and I will clothe you with festal apparel. Festal apparel being like party clothes, what you might wear to a party. The theme of redemption, which sometimes we call salvation, it's everywhere in scripture. Through the stories of ancient Israel and its beginnings, God's presence in the lives of God's people is fundamentally tied to their protection and their upbuilding as people that God wants to have a relationship with. 
even when they struggle, even when they fail, even when they fall away. And the nature of this relationship is that of covenant, a pact, we might call it. But in pagan religions, uh, a, a mortal might make a pact with a deity, and the deity sometimes gives them some advantage. But here, the deity makes a blood oath with its creation. And this relationship has nothing to do with favoritism or advantage. God doesn't just look favorably on one set of people because they made a covenant and everybody else, well, no. God made them all, you see. It is about helping people manage their frailties, honoring their commitment to try to do better. Our frailties being those parts of us that frankly demand little more from us than appeasing any wandering curiosity or carnal desire. You know, creation be damned. I'm going to get what I want when I want it. Instead, our God calls us into the heights of who we were created to be, but gives us the freedom to make mistakes. God does not expect perfection because we were not created perfect, but always hopes for the best from us, which can be a little annoying sometimes. And this God coaxes from us in degrees, not all at once, because God knows that we can and will falter in our resolve. Happens all the time. So great and patient is the Creator's love for us that generations may pass, and the same sin that binds each one might only dissolve a little bit. But sin's greatest flaw is its need for reinforcement, one reinforcing the next. If one but cheats it just a little bit, that sin grows desperate because it knows its doom is at hand. You see, the Holy Spirit never slumbers, it never tires, and for one great and glorious day in the life of a believer, it shines forth triumphant as a course is altered. Now, in United Methodism, we observe only two sacraments, and you see examples of them right there before you. The first being baptism, and then Holy Communion. And these acts are sacred to us because they were given to us as gifts and as commands from Jesus, who instituted them. They're gifts because they allow us an opportunity to welcome God into ourselves. Now, of baptism, John Wesley said in his treatise on baptism, by the way, if you ever need a sleeping pill, I'd advise you to read it. it uh, yeah, they, they talk very differently back then. Uh, but he says, it is the initiatory sacrament which enters us into covenant with God. Now, a covenant, that's not something you repeat, you know, unless it fails. In times of old, covenants were made between people by passing bloody pieces of meat between the participants as a visible and visceral reminder that, hey, that's what's going to happen to you if you break this blood oath. Implied in a covenant is a binding of two parties in blood, and woe to the one that breaks covenant. Now, God never breaks covenant, but we might. We often do. In fact, Scripture is full of references where that happens to the people of God. But get this. God is so invested in the covenant and our keeping it that God will literally share power with us, forgiving us, and then setting us back on the right path. That's how invested God is in our salvation. 
Now, baptism, baptism is only a step on the way to salvation. It is not an end itself. It's not the goal. But, frankly, nothing follows if it goes unobserved because commitment paves the road for the king. So just as John the Baptist boldly declared to Judea that the people prepare their hearts for the Messiah by preparing the way of the Lord. We hear that in Advent. So too we make a straight path for God to travel on when we decide to be baptized, to take of the waters. Now, if someone tells you different, you know, if someone tells you, hey, baptism, that's really the goal. Well, rest assured, they're not Methodist. For us, baptism is a beginning as it was for the Lord Jesus, a beginning that set him on the path to the cross, to his resurrection, and to his ascension. That path, that path was created long before Jesus went down into the waters. It started with his parents, their tutelage to him, to his time in the synagogue, to the moment he descended into the water, that whole path was made by other faithful people. People who cared about him. People who wanted him to know the faith of his people. You know, he didn't have to take vows to know that God was real. He had been led to the water by the people in his life who shared with him about the faith. So we, as Methodists, we don't turn babies away from baptism. We don't do that because we know that baptism creates a new road, but it is commitment, siblings in Christ, it is commitment that paves it. And so we do that for the young through confirmation, allowing them a chance to confirm the vows that were taken for them, perhaps in their infancy or a little later. Now, Holy Communion. That's all about unification with God. Not long after John's gospel recounts the feeding of the 5,000, we explored that a couple weeks ago, Jesus has a discourse with some religious elites on the technicality of how a man might call himself the bread of life, saying that if they eat from the bread, they'll live forever, and that God was the one that sent this bread for the world to consume. And what Jesus says is, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, the one who eats of me, they will also live because of me. And so we see that chain from father to child. What makes us think we're any different? We too are children of God. We too receive the gift. In communion, we remember how Jesus gave himself over willingly to his disciples to teach them of God's intentions and love for people. He knew Peter would betray him, and yet he said, keep going. The path led to his death, and he walked it anyway. You see, the nature of this love is sacrifice. God sacrificed the Son of Man that we might have salvation. Jesus sacrificed himself to teach his disciples about true love. What did he say? There is no greater love than this. There is no greater love than this, that a person would lay down their life for their friends. And we, God's people, are God's friends. As we unite ourselves to God each day that we walk the path that we try, Communion not only reminds us of Jesus' command that we love one another as we have been loved, but it makes it real for us, you know? 
There is the body. There is the blood. Generations removed from the events we commemorate. And we in our hope ask God in Jesus Christ to commune with us, to share with us here and now as the Holy Spirit, which does not know time or space, but is existent in every time and every space, gives us the power. Now, these two sacraments are built on a foundation that has been true for most Christians since the fourth century, and frankly, for some well before that. We believe these things because we believe that God's nature is triune. If we did not, well, it would be difficult for us to know God as Methodists do. The humanity found in Jesus makes all our beliefs valid. This idea that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. And we have a share in that nature as God's children too. Because there is something of us that is fully human and something that was put in us that is fully divine. Over the next several weeks, we'll dive deeper into our heritage as Methodists. I thought it fitting to do so at this time as we embark on this new journey together. We'll talk about God's grace, connectionalism, social holiness, sometimes called social justice, holy conferencing, and the driving force behind our core values, sometimes called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Now you'll get to hear more about how a group of seminary students at Oxford began to gather to deepen their prayer and to become better disciples of Christ than the system of faith in England at that time was teaching them. They thought they could do better, so they tried. And they became known as Methodists because they approached their faith methodically. And it all started in a place called Epworth. To God be the glory, and amen.